So today I'm going to give a, a short presentation on uh, how Pensando Distributed Systems a Services Platform, uh, you know, is used to scale NetApp ONTAP systems. Uh, you know, I'd like to start by saying, uh, you know, we've had this strategic relationship with Pensando for over three years now, three three and a half years, um, and it's been a you know it's been a it's been a great ride. Uh, we've had uh, engineering level engagement; uh, it's been amazing. Um, we've had this, uh, it's kind of like an extended group for the NetApp engineering team. And we've had very strong support from the ex executive leadership from both sides. So with, without further ado, let me just go through, I don't have too many slides here. Uh, these are the ones I'm gonna cover. Um, basically, uh, you know, start zooming into the agenda here. Uh, so in this sort of brief session, we're going to cover what, where Pensando fits into the NetApp portfolio, right? Uh, we'll sort of get into the what it is specifically, uh, what type of processing is offloaded to the Pensando card, um, and so digging further, we'll sort of look at you know how it uh, the offload the Pensando offload helps improve performance. And then I'm going to cover uh, scalability, uh, you know, and if, you know, in this sort of three dimensions of the scale cube. If, if you haven't uh, seen this sort of framework before, it's kind of a simplified way of talking about distributing compute and data, uh, and and sort of maybe it's overly simple, but you know, we're trying to kind of keep it, uh, uh, a, a, you know, at a way at a, at a level where. It's easy to understand some of these some of these concepts of how this is going to be how Pensando and it turns out Pensando is used in all three of these dimensions, right? So so we'll talk talk a little bit about that. So without further ado, I'll get into the uh, you know where does uh, Pensando fit in? So this is kind of a picture of of the products and this is just the system products for the most part. Uh, you know, the, of the NetApp portfolio, that there's a, you know, there's, you know, once if I included the software, I wouldn't have enough room here. Um, so where does this fit in? At the top levels, we kind of have the uh, on-prem sort of modern data uh, data center side of things. Um, and then we have sort of the hybrid cloud, which is our HCI and, and uh, solid fire uh, uh, systems. And then of course you have the public cloud, where we have, uh, you know, the uh, cloud volumes on tap and cloud volume services running on, you know, uh, all the major hyperscalers. Um, now, when, where Pensando fits in is in our A400, uh, which is a mid-range on tap system. Um, and it sort of came out uh, over, about a year ago. Um, so we've been shipping this for, for, quite, for uh, about 10 months now uh, on ONTAP 9.7. Um, we have, we have, um, other, uh, you know, if you look at it from our NVMe products, a, the other products are a, a 800, which is a high end NVMe. Uh, we have, uh, NVMe products as the a 400, there's also end to end NVMe. And then, uh, the a 220, which actually today, uh, we, uh, updated with the a 250, um, that's kind of a new product for the, on the entry side is also NVMe. So we have NVMe across the board uh, now in terms of the new platforms. Um, so basically, I think this is where it fits in because it's an opportunity to sort of then say, well, okay, where, how, what, are, what it's actually doing in that in that space. We wanted to start somewhere uh, and and then see what what we can do with this uh, technology. Uh, to be honest, on the initially, um, you know, we've been in the mode uh, on tap for the most part has been software. Uh, and running the, the, the storage uh, OS is running on x86 for the most part. In, in and way back in the early days, it did run on other other systems as well, uh, other instruction sets. But generally, we've kind of stayed away from offloads. Um, so this is kind of the first time uh, ONTAP has kind of gone into a you know some some of its path, uh, the ONTAP path, going into an offload scenario. And you know, there's so various reasons for that. Uh, we'll go into some of those. Um, so, what type of processing is being offloaded? When you have a choice, you're sort of partitioning the work, uh, you know, the, the CPU processing that happens on the, uh, you know, the, on the storage OS as the uh, on the x86 versus what happens on the you know, on the card and what kind of capabilities are there. 
So we kind of, when we looked at this, we've been looking at this obviously for a while. And generally, you know, four years ago, we would have, beyond four years ago, we would have thought, you know, we want to keep everything on the x86 because there's no real need. There's, you know, Moore's law was kind of moving along. We were getting improvements. We're getting more cores. Um, and, you know, we keep going in that space. Um, so what's different now and why are we doing it? Um, so what we found is as we look into the, uh, the, the data uh, of, of, you know, become more data centric, uh, there's a fair amount of operations. And we look into this a fair amount of detail. Um, not going to a little bit of that later, but we look at what kind of instructions and what kind of uh, stresses the, the, this kind of data centric workloads kind of create. Um, and there's a whole bunch. And, and when we went to all flash, we also have a lot of, um, you know, new uh, features that we wanted to add. And we've added them on x86 with storage efficiency features, right? Um, and things like compression. And, and we'll go into some of those as well. But, you know, those are somewhat not very friendly on x86 engines, so, you know, executing there. And hardware is actually a lot better place to do this. So there's a spectrum of, of types of functions that are much better and much more efficient, order of magnitude bit faster and, and more efficient in terms of amount of energy it's used, amount of uh, speed at which we can generate and cost. Um, so when imagine this uh, process that's running x86 instructions and you know for all flash we have these inline checksums rate checksums going on uh, that will involve going through passing through the entire data set data uh, or you know large chunks of data that's what we mean by the bulk data um, and they're doing something some fairly simple instructions onto that the other type is uh, transforms where we're transforming the data in a sort of lossless way like doing a compression and when we do compression, we take a, a block and we compress it or a certain block size and we compress it to a smaller block size. Well, we want to ensure that we have, you know, at NetApp, we're sort of paranoid about data integrity. Um, and we want to make sure that the reverse transform is also going to give you back the data that you started off with, right? Um, so we actually uh, require that in our, in our, in our system. And part of the things we're about not doing it outside was we we're obviously concerned about that data integrity. So we wanted that data integrity of, okay, when we do a transform in one direction, we've got to be able to do that and, and check that. Uh, so we have that uh, enabled where we go back and forth. Uh, and that takes more, you know, more, more processing, but that's kind of what we would like to do for data integrity. Um, so what is it that we like about it? Generally, what we like about it is the flexibility that it gives. What we're doing here, we're creating, this is a whole, you know, we have a compute engine in the x86 and it's a you know, system by itself. And this card is essentially a whole computer by itself, right? It, it, has, it has compute capability, it has shared memory, and it has networking, all right? And what we wanna do is we'll say, well, the shared memory and the processing is very flexible. Uh, you have ARM cores, mostly for management and sequencing uh, operations. You have the P4 engines, which are, you know, uh, very fast processing engines. Uh, and you have the hardware engines, the hardware engines to do compression, right? Uh, you know, they're, those are very specific. They're, you know, can do these kinds of compression very, very fast and, and very, very efficiently compared to x86 engines. So this is kind of the combination and they're on a shared memory, so they can kind of mix and match. Um, and then, of course, you've got networking, which is, you know, the protocols can be implemented uh, using these compute engines. So we've got a whole computer engine, a computer system, you know, sitting inside. Now, if it's in a card form factor, um, it's sitting inside one of, the, uh, one of our A400 boxes for now. All right, we have two of them in the box because we have a HA pair. Uh, so we have two nodes. But being over a network, in theory, it can be used from other places as well. So it now creates a layer and, and the ONTAP systems are clustered. So you have a, a you know, you have a, a clustered system of nodes, and then, you know, this creates another. So essentially we were, and we have a, a nice API uh, that's we defined and right from the beginning where, so we can talk to that API and which engine gets used and how it gets done. Um, that's actually hidden from that API. You do the best implementation and we have requirements of how fast uh, it's also very deterministic. So when you're using the hardware engines, it comes back 
you know, at a, at a very fixed time. Uh, and that helps. We don't want that variability. There may be queuing variability if we, you know, if we use up all the engines, but we know what that number is, so we, we can we can manage that. So that kind of helps. Um, so this is kind of in a nutshell where the Pensando PCI card kind of comes in, right? We we have uh, network cap capability. We have very flexible compute, and you know, more and more, what I'm what I'm seeing is that the the you get ASIC like speeds. Um, from this, but you still get programmability. And so, you know, in the spectrum of, of you know, a hard uh, ASIC, where it doesn't give you much flexibility, uh, all the way to, you know, full programming capability, uh, say through an x86 or an ARM, this gives you a spectrum of these. And FPGA, even though, you know, there's a lot of ease of use, there's other challenges with FPGAs um, in terms of power and use requirements and so forth. So. We like this because of the flexibility of the programming uh, and the speed of, uh, of the ASIC. Okay. Hey, Naresh, I've, I've, I've got yeah. a question. So one of the slides prior, you mentioned that this is in sort of the mid-range systems from NetApp, the, the 400 range. Um, just looking at the slide now, you've got 100 gig ethernet speeds there. Is that really what mid-range storage is about these days? 100 gig Ethernet, those quick. Yeah, and that's a good point. Yeah, it's a good point. Uh, so, um, you know, we are we the we're using this in the mid range. Our mid range actually does get to 100 gig. Um, we are looking for optimizing cost performance in the mid range, um, and the mid range has got to that. Right. I mean, I, the entry. You know, we we announced the uh, A250 entry system. That's at 25 gigs. Right, so we're upping the sort of the speeds, uh, and we're looking at you know. Uh, so obviously, you know, through a, through a switch, you can go to a lower speed. We also remember this is also our. We're using it as our you know at the heart of the the system, uh, which is the cluster interconnect. So we're doing a lot of movement around here, uh, and we want to make sure we have enough bandwidth uh, to sort of move data around. Uh, so th this is just a requirement that we need for the speeds that we we have coming in. So you've got to look at it. This is a cluster network. It's not just connect. It's not connecting to the front end ports. This is connecting to on tap system, a, a cluster of systems, and you kind of need the performance there to handle uh, cluster level. And I'll I'll talk to that a little bit later actually, where that comes into play. That's a good point though. It's a good question. I got a follow on question to Ian's uh, point. So. You, yeah. Like you said, you have this in a, in a mid-range system. Um, is this telling me and the listeners that NetApp is per perhaps anticipating your enterprise systems are not going to be, uh, I guess, as popular or people looking at more uh, lower cost, high performance through uh, solutions like Pensando in mid-range? I'm, I'm trying to understand why this hasn't gone to your, your upper end if there's so much uh, value and performance out of the card. Oh yeah, no, that's a good question. Yeah, I mean, so what what we wanted to do as new systems come along, I mean, so you can retrofit it into obviously it's a card solution. We can put it into older systems, uh, existing systems. Uh, we wanted to introduce it as a new system was announced, right? So we're putting it into new systems as they come along. So yeah, in time we can you can see that happening as well. Um, and it made sense to put it put it here. It provided value in the mid range, uh, and that's that's why it's there. It's it's a uh, uh, you know the high end I think would be a a uh, obviously uh, even you know more value could be provided there. Uh, and we're looking at the generations right at the next generation of what where where those would go. Um, but yeah, it's just a matter of you know it's obviously a new product. Um, it's been it's been rock solid for us. We've been shipping it for a year in volume um, as a mid range. So it's every box that goes out that's a mid range A four hundred has the, two of these cards in it, right? So it's not a and and to be honest, we kind of wanted to set, test it rather than going full full blown across the uh, entire portfolio, right? And so now we've got a year under our belt. Um, it's actually uh, you know it's it's proven itself out. Uh, to be to be very uh, rock solid, so yeah, that's that's why. Yeah, you, you're right. I think it would it makes more sense the the faster the system capability is. Um, this one kind of fit the right kind of mold. Uh, the other thing is we also you know look at the the PCI 
speeds that we need, because remember, we're connecting this through PCI and, and the current systems are PCI Gen 3, and this is a PCI Gen 3 connected card. And we'll, in future, we're looking at faster because you kind of, you don't, we don't want to run into a bottleneck on the PCI, mm -hmm. right, uh, for these systems. Um, so the 100 gig sort of matches, uh, you know, a by 16 PCI through Gen 3, and we would, you know, and that would step up as we go to higher, uh, as PCI Gen 4 and so on uh, becomes available. So if we go on to, um, you know, continuing on that sort of you know, digging a little deeper, um, and I talked a little bit about this, what we're looking at this bug data and transforms. I'm, the memory bandwidth from the storage, you know, the CPU, the x86 CPU to main memory, uh, even though there's a fair amount of bandwidth there, and it's probably, you know, in my mind, a little bit over spec on, on bandwidth. Um, it's a, you know, when we do bulk transfers on there, uh, and what we do in general is that we, uh, we, we optimize in the storage OS, we optimize uh, by delaying some operations and doing them in a batch mode, right? And then we have to spread that batch mode. And at the same time, we're doing interactive load and having a very, very low latency. Um, so what happens is you wanna make sure that you don't hit the uh, bus, the memory bus too aggressively. Uh, in terms of the load in the burst, act, burst uh, mode. Um, what we find, and we've actually looked at this, the last level cache, we have a lot of, in, the, in this kind of work, workloads, and I think it's quite general in enterprise workloads, where you have lots of different types of streams coming in. Um, there's a lot of activity, you know, they don't fit in the, C, in the last level cache, the data, certainly the data cache, the metadata, the amount, amount of information that's needed to, to operate uh, a highly parallel set of um, um, operations uh, for storage, uh, you, we get a lot of main memory sort of cache misses, right? Um, so we have to go into main memory. There's a lot of traffic that flows. And a lot of the performance is dictated by, you know, probably about half the time the CPUs or cores uh, are waiting for main memory, the sort of backend bottleneck. So it's not so much the memory bandwidth, it's the memory latency. And if you load it up heavily uh, for some periods of time, during that period of time, you're gonna get a much higher memory latency. And that shows up as CPU, we go CPU path lengths would be expanded. It takes, you know, CPU overhead increase. And, and that slows down the whole system and you get, uh, you know, latency. So what we wanna do is take one of the, those bulk data trans and, and transforms and move them somewhere else and out, outside of that, right, mode. And what we're doing, we're taking those and we're essentially moving them into a pen, in the Pensando card. What that does now is that it takes those and it's now very, very efficiently doing that. And it's got high bandwidth memory. It's got lots of big caches in, internally. And it's doing that in, with hardware engines. And you can do that much more efficiently there. Moreover, it's actually freeing up the, the sort of the, you know, the stream going through. We've looked at this not recently, but a few, quite a few years ago, we looked at how bursty the traffic patterns are going. It is on a memory bus, we put a logic analyzer on it and checked it. And it is very bursty, right? So it doesn't show up in the average sort of bandwidth usage. It, it shows up in the sort of peak usage. There's a lot of cache misses that happen. Um, and, and then they go, and the story, and the, the CPU cores are not and are very inefficiently used in that way. So we think that there's a little bit of movement in that, probably not huge, but it'll movement in that direction into reducing the, 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 uh, the variability in, uh, in the sort of the traffic that you see. So this is sort of the offloading benefits. I mean, obviously you're moving function into somewhere else. That means you don't have to do the function in, in the x86, so you save CPU cycles that way. Um, and that reduces the memory bandwidth usage. Uh, but I think moreover, what it does is that also, and that might be might, maybe not so obvious, is that it helps maintain this consistent latency. You get more out of the, the CPU cores and it maintains a little bit more consist consistency over the um, you know, memory accesses or memory latency that we see. And so more generally, if you sort of, what we look at, we and this is this chart is a is very simplified kind of chart looking at random arrivals and, and random service times, uh, but if you look at these, the, the blue curve is when there's very little very or, or minimal variability, still random kind of variability. As you increase the variability of the service, 
um, you know, this curve kind of bends upwards. So the latency goes up at a, at a given load level. Uh, and, you know, this K equals three, the green line is, is even much higher variability. Um, so what we are thinking is that it, by pushing down, the, reducing the variability, you get a better latency curve on your, uh, at least for memory latency and an overall operation. And the half latency uh, knee is, happens to be sort of a point at which we, where we look at uh, is sort of the optimal sort of maximum where we want to run it, where bef beyond, beyond which you start getting very high latencies. So that's kind of the knee, mathematically calculated knee of the curve. And you can see that it, we're kind of moving, you get more load and you're actually reducing the, the relative latency. Um, any, did any, any questions on that? Yeah, if you were to tie that, um, that diagram to an application, what kind of application is giving that kind of a, a, of a, of a diagram for the storage? Uh, you're, uh, on the right hand side, you mean? Mm -hmm. What mm -hmm. kind of application? Actually, so the IOPS oriented workloads, um, so database transactions, um, you know, doing small random reads and random writes. Uh, we're looking at that as you load up the system, um, you know, we, we get this kind of uh, you know, latency curve. We actually run this in ONTAP all the time uh, and we look at workloads and uh, we, we actually figure out what, these, what this histogram looks like at various load levels and we predict what this half latency knee is. And we use this as our, as our sort of measure of provisioning. So if we end up being kind of nice and low here, we say, okay, we can add more. And this is what tells you, tells the system that it's kind of full in terms of its CPU capability, right? Um, and more and more we're seeing as we're looking at all flash, more and more we're seeing the CPU cores is where the bottleneck is. Right, it's it's not the uh, the storage. I mean, what used to be, you know, you get hard drives, and hard drives can quite easily bottleneck. Uh, and then the answer was to add more hard drives. Here, more often, we're saying, well, okay, the CPU is bottlenecked. Uh, what can we do about it? And then you, either you need to sort of, you know, go to a higher core or move some work off of that node and move to other one, or or use the automated mechanisms to do that. Um, so I think, uh, yeah, OLTB transaction processing, any sort of op-oriented NFS uh, workloads. Um, I mean, it shows up in curves like this. If you look at SPC1, uh, if you look at uh, the benchmarks, if you look at um, uh, the spec benchmarks, the spec storage benchmarks, they all kind of have curves like this. So mm -hmm. kindergarten question. <laughs> um, the knee part of it is basically you're looking for that sweet spot where you can bend so you're able to get higher up on the chart, right? Is that what knee Correct. means? You're able to bend it there? Okay. Okay. Yeah, the knee is, yeah, it's the bend of the knee. It's mathematically calculated. Uh, we've written okay. papers on that. Yeah. Excellent. Excellent. Thank you. Um, so, so let me go into the sort of the other part of this, which is the, uh, the scaling part of it. And so what we've been talking about mostly here, uh, and this is the key value, is that we're looking at how um, these, this processing is split um, and is split in, you know, from what the x86 does to what the Pensando card does. And these are, the, these are the kind of things, there's a way to look at it from a scaling. We call it y-axis because it's kind of the vertical, what we call vertical scaling. We're taking a slice and we're taking this vertical scaling, we're making it that slice faster. Um, so it's, you can imagine that it's a node uh, or a contr storage controller, a single storage controller, and we're trying to make that go faster. And it could be on the motherboard, uh, everything on the motherboard, or it's on the uh, PCI card on the motherboard. Um, so these C1s and C2s are essentially one of them is sort of, you know, the regular x86 and we split into some other compute, the sharing the data. Um, and, and then, uh, and we, we run through a sequence and you can imagine a sequence, one of the sequences being, you know, you do a, uh, say you do a dedupe calculation, so you calculate a hash, uh, you do compression, uh, then you do encryption, right? Or, you, you know, you do some raid checksum on, on it. So you do these operations and you want to collect these together and sequence through, through them. And you want to do that not in the car, you want to, don't want to do that on the x86, on, on sort of expensive CPUs, you want to do that on, on the card and, and have that done in a tight loop, right? And, and so that's kind of what we're doing. We're looking at, so these kind of things are, these sort of operations, not, not that we do all of these, some of these are done in x86 still, zero 
zero detection, and so this is compression. As I said, compression is very expensive on the CPU. Um, the dedupe hashing, a dedupe is sort of collecting uh, blocks that are very they're identical or subsequences that are identical and, and packing packing them. Uh, and then compaction, this for us is still on the x86, but we're looking at see how we could do that uh, outside. And this is sort of saying, you know, once you've compressed all these little blocks, there's a lot of free space left. And how do you compact that even further so you can squeeze it in, into a smaller space? Now, you know, as you know, data is sort of still continues to increase exponentially. And some of these things uh, for a, for all flash, th these are sort of you have to have, right? To sort of get a good storage efficiency uh, um, play. So this is kind of the benefits that we get. Uh, these are, and there's also, I didn't mention the sort of security computation, encryption, and so forth. Um, and of course, we get the networking, we get a NIC functionality, and, and we get RDMA, uh, Rocky V2, and specifically uh, functionality. Naresh, I've got a and question for you real fast. I'm sorry. Yeah, to so what no I'm worries. seeing on this, on this slide, it's, I would just say very simply, you're offloading a lot of, a lot of operations to Pinsando. Um, is that, that's correct, right? So right. When, I, when, I, when an application uh, end user reads data, does that go through Pinsando? The, what, what data, where's the data flow when uh, an application is reading off of the A400? Yeah, no, good question. So the, the flow is that you read it off the drives. Now, if it's compressed, it will go through Pensando to be decompressed. Okay. And, and then send out of the front end ports, right? So that and, gets and my second so, part of the question, though. So what, what kind of memory is sitting on, on the Pensando card? Are we talking about storage class memory or DIM? What, what kind of... Uh, this particular card, the Naples card, um, has high bandwidth memory. Got it. Yeah, it has high bandwidth memory, and and it has some you know fairly big caches. That if we're using this the way we're using it, if it, most of it would probably stay in the cache, it could stay in the caches because it doesn't have to actually use that memory directly. But it's there if if we go above a certain size, All right? So it's very highly parallel, um, and in um you know maybe Francis can go into more detail uh, onto what that is, but. Yeah, it's it's very highly parallel in terms of cap its capabilities. But yeah, that's it. All the data, if it's now if it's not compressed, yeah, uh, because not everything is compressed, then it'll go straight through it. It won't use the card, right? And these days, everything is uh, anything coming in, we is an opportunity for compression, an opportunity for dedupe. So anything coming in on our on our right side, um, we we would have to you know we want to make sure that does it compress or not, and based on its compression level, we will decide what to do, right? So then it gets used all the time. So yeah, the data flow is definitely, uh, it's always there. And, and uh, uh, at least on, on this part, right? Um, you know, once you've compressed it and, and done storage efficiency and you get sort of a three to one or even more uh, kind of uh, storage efficiency kind of ratio, you get the benefits compound, you get more and more, right? You get, you know, they, you get snapshots, you get clones on the box, you sort of use that storage efficiency for secondary uh, data services. So as you move it, it's still in a compact, compressed form. Uh, and, 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 and also we tier to the public cloud, we tier less data once you kind of compress it. So this is where it helps. Um, so the benefits kind of compound once you, and that's kind of a standard thing for us, uh, uh, but Pensando helps there. Um, Moving on to sort of the, and then this is kind of the Z axis. This is using the cluster ports of Pensando. What this does is gives us when somebody, and so if you look at the Z axis here, you've got a bunch of compute nodes. What, what happens with, what we, what we have a feature called um, uh, flex groups. What this does is it distributes the data uh, across a bunch of nodes. And so these little Ds, D1, D2, D4, are partitions of that. It does a hash and figures out where it needs to go, right? So files uh, are placed in parts of, uh, are placed in different areas. Now that gives you a distributed namespace uh, across all the nodes, and so it, it creates a, a large, uh, you know, very large sort of um, single large mega volume. Um, you know, it's, it scales up to sort of architecturally 20 petabytes and you know, something like 4 billion, 400 billion files uh, you can put into this namespace. Um, and we find customers, you know, especially the electronic design automation 
uh, chip design, uh, you know, mostly high tech, oil and gas, uh, media and entertainment, these, these types of industry verticals. I uh, really like this one, uh, a very big container, and it does things sort of automatic distribution for you. Right, the, the, the compute. Now, it, it's this works, it gives very high performance because it's using all the resources very evenly, and then it does it automatic load balancing, and as you add more nodes, you does it more, more load balancing for you. Uh, Pensando Nix here, when you have the A400 here, uh, they are being used for this distribution, right? And moreover, you know, we have to manage that. There's lots of little, you know, under the covers, there's lots of little, little transfers that are required and we want low latency for those little transfers to sort of manage that. So the, in, the software infrastructure we need, uh, you know, we need low latency access and, and movement in, within the cluster. And that's what Pensando provides here. So that's kind of the, uh, the uh, sort of Z axis, which is essentially partitioning the data and then distributing it across multiple uh, compute engines, yeah. So, so where's the ONTAP magic done in all of this? So uh, how's ONTAP interacting with the P Pensando car to make decisions around, uh, you know, flex groups or whether it should compress, um, you know, snapshots, that kind of thing? Um, so most of that is still in the x86. Um, you know, the whole, all of the ONTAP rich data management is still going there. Um, it's various processes that are in ONTAP that make that up. It's using specific functions from the, from the Pensando card, like compression and so forth. So most of the, the control is still in, X, is still in uh, x86, right? This is, yeah, so, so it's kind on, of on a tap function. At, so yeah, so, so ONTAP kind of still looks at the data as it, as it is pushed into the box and then we'll offload, we'll make a decision about right. offload or not after that. Yeah, exactly. So we actually have a parallel. So in software, for everything that we do in hardware, as a as an offload, we also have an equivalent software version, and and so we can continue if the hardware goes away. Um, but uh, it's much slower. It can be sometimes really really slow, right? So um, so you know we want to have both. We kind of want it, and, and it has to be exactly right. So you know if it compresses on the hardware in a particular way, it has to compress in the same way. Um, on, and be able to decompress the data in software as well as in hardware. And, and so it allows us to kind of do both. So it's, it is an optimization uh, to be able to do it in the hardware and, and get the best of both, right? So, but the main control is still, you know, all the, uh, yeah, it, this is an API at a, at a fairly high level. It's the shim layer above the sort of driver. And at that, 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 that defines all the sequencing uh, what kind of things need to be, and so if you use, it's available to all the on, entire ONTAP uh, software to make use of that. So it's, it's really a function call, it, it makes a request to the hardware, uh, something comes back, right? It's a request response, and we have an equivalent one in software to do that. So that's all the ONTAP subsystems have that uh, ability. So it is, that's kind of how we structured. Now we could in the longer term do more than that and put more control down. But I think these, it's a very regular sequence kind of operation. When we have these bulk transfers, we try to pack them and do them together when we can anyway, because it's more efficient that way. This is kind of, we've taken that and moved it in a different place. Okay. Yeah, good question. Nirosh, I have a question too. Yeah. Um, so since specific functions are being offloaded to the Pensando card, at, are users at any time able to access the data that's being processed by Pensando? I did. I think we, so. The front end for us is is really where that what the data the end users see for us, right? So that stays the same. Um, the data going flowing through, we have more visibility uh, at a lower level because of the, that's the other advantage of Pensando. It gives us sort of nice visibility into what's going on on the network. Uh, but this is sort of abstracted out. So this is an optimization within the the storage OS. And from a user perspective, they don't see any of it. Okay. Right. It's hidden. It's hidden from the cost, uh, from the from the end user. Or the, they see just the front end active. They just see things happening faster, more capability from the box. That's kind of how they see it. But the actual data that's flowing, they don't see that. Right. What's happening under the covers? Okay. Thank you. Right. Okay. In the rush. Sorry. One more question on this. The the high resiliency piece at the bottom there. So I'm not too familiar with how ONTAP facilitates those non-disruptive operations. Does Pensando 
integration bring anything to that? Does it help to make things more resilient or anything like that? Um, yeah, I think this is, uh, we make sure we have to ensure that it's high, still uh, resilient, but th this is the non-disruptive operations. So we can, you know, take out one of the controllers and replace it without you know, keeping the operation, the, the storage operations going all the time. Uh, we can sort of replace a box, uh, you know, with continued operation by sort of evacuating and things like that. I think it helps in the thing, in the way that by compressing it, it helps indirectly, not directly. Indirectly, it sort of compresses the data, makes it smaller. You can move things around faster. Um, so, you know, you've got a hundred gig link, you can move it out faster. Uh, and you can do things more efficiently. So it helps from that perspective, um, but not, you know, the offload functions are not directly helping with the, uh, with the uh, resiliency aspect. I have a question here. So, so far we talked about, you know, how you manage the, the, the Pensando uh, card as a you know, front-end interface, uh, but uh, did you ever thought about uh, giving the option to your customers to buy also Pensando cards on their clients so they can uh, improve the connectivity. I mean, having all the traffic encrypted, managed by by the cards or other, you know, functionality that uh, can improve the traffic in the front end, not just uh, at your... Yeah, no, that's a good point. Yeah, so this, yeah, you're right. This is, you're, this is a more on the clustering. That's kind of a start where we want to go with, and, and there's potential for the front end activity, front end ports as well, and on the client side. There's value generally, and I think if you sort of merge all of these together, um, then when you have applications that are running and they can benefit from the, from the Pensando card as well. I think it's that's another level, um, certainly getting to the application. Uh, our use case right now is more at, the, at using it for our cluster network. So it's a very specific you know, storage OS need. Definitely, it could be used, and 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 many of other, and, and maybe uh, Fran Francis will go through some of that, which is other use cases for for the card. And uh, another question about you know, uh, there are a couple of other products in your product lineup like uh, Solid Fire and uh, Storage Grid, for example. Also, this product can benefit from from this kind of approach. Do you think that you are going to adopt these cards also for these products or? We're we're looking at that. We're looking at all options. Yeah, certainly HCI uh, product could could take it. Um, uh, storage grid potentially. Uh, we'd have to look at that and and, and see. We, we certainly looked at this. This was in terms of when we were looking at where to place it. On tap was a, was the spot where we where we thought this was a good fit. Yeah, that's a good point. Okay, let me let me move on. I don't have too many more slides here. Um, so then finally, this sort of x-axis, so I think a little bit off, out of order in terms of scaling, but this one is, um, you know, in the previous one, we kind of think, well, there's these C's and D's, uh, but sometimes what you want, you want a certain amount of your data and you want to put a lot of uh, compute behind it, a lot of storage uh, performance behind it. And what, and usually is your hot data. So this is a distribution kind of mechanism where the hot data gets distributed. It's essentially copied on a number of different nodes. And uh, this, this is what Flex, Flex Cache does. Um, and when it's within a cluster, then the Pensando card is providing the mechanism to do the uh, movement across the, the, the cluster interconnect. So what it's doing is it's taking, essentially making, if it's hot data, it's making copies on demand uh, on different nodes. And they're all, the data is going through the uh, Pensando card that's connected on the on the controller. Um, of course, that's where uh, you know all the you know again this is the secondary benefit of having it all compressed and and deduped and so forth. But the distribution um, allows you to to have a piece of data that's hot have a lot of compute. So you're bringing the the data closer to the sort of compute engine, um, essentially making multiple copies of it as needed. And then keeping that up to date, uh, and so this is where it goes beyond the cluster as well uh, as a more gen general thing. Um, and obviously, we've made it sophisticated enough to handle writes and and so write delegations and things like that. So there's a lot of other under the scene under the covers. There's a whole bunch of other uh, activities that go on, and having very low latency access, you know, the Pensando card then helps there too, right? 
So this is kind of the win on, on, on this one. So, I mean, putting it all together, um, what we have is, you know, these three dimensions. You know, we start off with a, a single monolithic sort of architecture with the compute and data all in one. And, and this is kind of one node. Um, uh, we do the split and the split basically creates more compute engines. And, and in this case, we're creating a compute engine just on, on, on a card but the, you know, it could be in gener generically, it could be anywhere in the cluster uh, on the fabric. Um, so you get a functional decomposition. And of course, nowadays it's sort of the same as sort of looking at microservices and components and Kubernetes is kind of doing this. What usually is forgotten though, is the data is important. When you have lots of data, it's actually a stateful application like databases has a lot of data. And so moving a, bit, a database, moving the, 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 the CPU or the compute part of it somewhere else uh, is harder. If it's a stateless or relatively stateless sort of application, you can move the compute and you know the data is easy to move with it because uh, you just copy the data. And if you have a terabyte, you just can't, can't do that easily, right? Um, so this is kind of the split by function or service or data affinity. And you have to come up with, you know, what are the functions that you kind of, how you split it. Uh, the other dimension, the sort of Z axis that we looked at uh, was data partitioning. Right, which, where we're looking at the flex groups, which is creating these little little bees uh, across the cluster, and of course the cluster interconnect is important there. And similarly, where we're distributing, we're making copies of the data. This is replication, sort of what we call technical de uh, de deduplication um, or duplication rather. You're making copies uh, to so that we can get more compute uh, onto those hot pieces of data. Okay, so that's kind of putting it all together. So when you've got all three of them going, um, and which is kind of what we have, we sort of Pensando explicitly does this one on the y-axis. On the, the clustering kind of gives you the other two axes. You kind of have a, a, a mode where you can get all of them in one, at one time, and you, you get near infinite scale because you can scale in multiple ways. I kind of like this approach because it sort of takes care of data as well as compute. Uh, it's just a framework to think about it, um, but it's a nice way of thinking about it. Um, and it's been written up uh, in, uh, in ScaleCube, here's a sort of reference to it. Uh, but I kind of added my little diagrams for this. Um, anyway, that's kind of what I had. Um, I want to, you know, just to so go over you what we've covered. Um, you know, we shipped it back in 10 months ago. It's been rock solid. Uh, it's, it's in every A400, a couple of these cards. It's kind of, we haven't talked about it much, but, uh, um, you know, it's, we talked about the primary offloads uh, for bulk data and transforms. Um, most of the benefits are the CPU usage, as the latency improvements. Um, and I think cost performance is, was our initial, was our target. Uh, we had to, we insist on cost performance improvement. You know, especially this is a card that we're adding, which is more hardware that we're adding. Uh, there's an increase in cost. So it has to have that much more performance to make, make sense, right? Um, so there's definitely an increase in performance. Um, and it has various benefits in these three dimensions that we talked about, you know, the, the y-axis for uh, direct vertical scaling by processing things, the, the expensive uh, bulk offloads. Uh, the z-axis was for flex groups uh, using the networking uh, scale out. And then horizontal scaling uh, was through flex cache. Um, so that's pretty much all I had. So, in, but in closing, I, I just want to sort of reemphasize, you know, the uh, uh, the strong engineering engagement that we've had with Pensando. Um, you know, both sides have sort of had a, a very open communication and in sharing resources, strong work ethic, um, and CEO level support uh, right from the beginning, and that that helped. So I kind of look forward to continuing to working on the next generation with Pensando.